You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Carrie Lutz. Well, we got an amazing jobs number last week, but was it really that amazing? Are the books cooked? Are they telling us the truth? Well, our good friend David M. Straszewski is with us now. David, uh, welcome back. So what about these job numbers? Uh, are they showing reality or are they just a political creation like everything else? <laughs> uh, well, great to be uh, with you here, Carrie. So yeah, the January jobs report sounds, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably because it is. Uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics on Friday uh, came out with this 517 positive amount of new jobs that were just added. Um, here's the thing that, that we're, we're not as aware of if we don't understand these reports and how they're created. And so in, in January here, they added two and a half million uh, sorry, the, the, without the seasonal adjustments uh, in January, we were two and a half million actually short of what we had here in December, which is incredible. So we've got this idea of the, the seasonal adjustments, which is supposed to smooth things out. But this BLS report ends up adding an additional three million jobs uh, in order to get to come up with this figure. So these are, you know, out of nowhere jobs that they do based upon uh, some some specific ideas that they call seasonal ideas. And so uh, if conversely, if we look at November and December, though, uh, they actually subtracted 2.14 million in order to come up with those numbers. So uh, I think it's better to ignore this report altogether than to put a tremendous amount of weight in it. Of course, we saw the market, though, kind of respond to the Fed last week, thinking they were going to be a little bit more dovish. And then on Friday, we got this report and then they said, oh, my goodness, this is worse than what we thought. They're going to be, you know, at this uh, for, for longer. And so uh, we find ourselves in a very interesting time right now, as I really think that there's three primary opinions on what's going on in our economy. Uh, so opinion number one is what the Fed thinks. Opinion number two is what the markets think. And then opinion number three should be what reality ultimately says. And this really comes down to this idea of what the terminal rate is. So that the Federal Reserve is uh, raising interest rates and they're hoping to get to this uh, magic place that they don't even know where it is, uh, that, that's called a terminal rate. And when they get there, uh, then it's expected that inflation is just gonna go down automatically and not just because of these rapid increases like we've seen. And so, um, the, the market believes that we've already hit our terminal rate. And so what they're expecting the Fed to do is, is to pause uh, in these, uh, these rate increases and then pivot to a lower uh, and reducing uh, terminal rate um, over uh, the next 12 months. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I probably agree with, with the market, specifically the bond market, uh, that we likely have gotten to a terminal rate or a place where I think it makes sense to to pause and begin to understand, you know, hey, where are we at? Have we uh, gotten to this place? Is Are things coming down naturally? Or are they coming down because of, of this, you know, very, very, very significant uh, increase that we've seen uh, by the Fed? Um, you know, the Fed is ultimately saying, hey, we're going to be higher for longer. Um, and uh, And so I think that they're you know, probably tightening into a recession right now, which should be a concern uh, to, uh, to to people today, because, um, you know, if they begin to pivot and we're already in a recession and we find ourselves in a bad economic position, well, guess what? I don't know that there's much that the Fed can do to, to swiftly change things. Uh, so I think of the, the, the good history lesson here is that if we look back at the late 70s, and what had to happen with Paul Volcker, you know, he he you know hesitated on the, on the interest rates, uh, started pulling back, and then saw inflation take off again, and then had to really you know ramp things up. In 2018, the Federal Reserve was 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 raising uh, the terminal rate, and then what happened is we saw that almost 20 uh, percent downturn, like 19.9, I think it was in the Nasdaq, I believe it was February, and. Uh, uh, and, and so then the Fed just quickly accommodated and brought us down to these record low interest rates, which, of course, you know, got our economy, uh, in, in my opinion, way overheated uh, as we headed into this time frame where inflation was absolutely ramping up and it was not transitory as they thought. So 
I think the reality of, of where we're going next is, is somewhere in between what the Fed thinks and what the market actually believes. So I think they're probably going to see a couple of, of, uh, of, of rate hikes uh, from here, uh, a quarter point higher. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, some unemployment happening in the uh, tech sector, but, but we all know that the tech sector was, was overvalued. We all know that the tech sector had way too much money. Every VC deal got done. Every uh, uh, IPO got, got established. And so, you know, if we look at just even the lifestyle of these employees, you know, that were at Twitter and Facebook and Google and just the amazing, you know, accommodations that they had, that's not likely as real uh, kind of as, as we look at, uh, at the world here today. Uh, but as far as unemployment goes, I think small and medium uh, sized companies are still uh, hiring. I think that there's proof that that's within that. Uh, it's just that they're going to be hiring uh, at a um, a lower price than what the big tech companies were paying previously. So I think there's a, a big um, you know revaluation coming from this work from home uh, reality. And you uh, know work from home is still wonderful, uh, and and employees are still needed. Uh, but but we're going to find ourselves in a tighter uh, economy right now, and and so this opens up. I think opportunities for the small and, and, and mid-sized companies as there is some unemployment, uh, but look at that, two and a half uh, million uh, jobs less than, than what they're actually saying uh, you know, from, from December. So I, I'm not convinced uh, that we really have a good fact set to be working from, and uh, you know, ultimately statistics can lie here. So uh, it's anyone's guess. Hey, it's anybody's guess. You know, Maybe the purpose of these numbers, besides painting a a brighter picture, if you will. Maybe what they're really about is just giving the Fed some elbow room to get in a couple more increases before they inevitably have to pivot, and they're going to. I don't think right. there's any question about that. But now it looks pretty good. Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Torque Resources is an exploration company establishing a portfolio of premier copper gold early stage projects in Chile. Torque's management and technical teams have a strong track record of raising capital, discovery, and monetization of exploration successes. The company's Margarita Copper Gold project is located within the prolific coastal Cordillera Belt in Chile, which hosts some of the world's largest and most profitable copper mines. The Margarita project possesses excellent discovery potential for a major copper discovery due to the strength of the alteration system, large-scale magnetic targets, and the presence of copper oxide mineralization. Drilling is anticipated to begin in Q3 of this year. Torque trades in Canada under TORQ and on the OTC under TRBMF. To learn more, go to TorqueResources.com. That's TorqueResources.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Well, it, it sure does, at least in the short term, you know, and, and, and we like to look at the world in, in, in three different time frames. you know, just like the watch on my hand has a, an hour hand, a minute hand and a second hand. Those are three different time frames without it throughout our day. Neither one of our, t are telling the time exactly right or wrong. They're just telling it exactly the way that it should be for where we are in a minute, an hour or the day. And so uh, right now in the short to midterm, we are seeing some positive uh, things that are that are that are moving forward, and so you know, is this a a, a bear bounce or a dead cat bounce, a bull trap, as it's also called? Uh, in my opinion, it likely is looking like that, as opposed to this being a new cyclical bull uh, indicator. And the reason why I can say that is that you know there are five indicators that that we can track that are either never wrong or rarely wrong that are all flashing warning signs today. And so the first one with that is to look at the inversion that's taking place right now in the yield curve. And so this is where we get this idea of what do the markets think? So the markets think that the, the, there's gonna be, you know, a transition that's gonna be taking place here sometime this year. And so that they, they tell that uh, between the difference between the short-term rates being a lot more money uh, for for the the investment than a longer term rate like even the ten year treasury. So if you even look at the one month uh, term right now to the ten year treasury, it is much higher uh, than uh, uh, that we actually even saw in two thousand and eight or the dot com. And so that's really important, I think, for us to to understand here because this inversion. Uh, has, has been an incredibly accurate indicator uh, of where we are. And it's getting closer and closer as we're now at the one month time frame as opposed to just the two year. Uh, we've got falling PMIs. And, and, and so this is when we look at those who produce and manufacture, um, this is the wholesale. 
This is uh, activity that's taking place. If we fall below 50, that means that we're in a contractionary market. If we expand beyond 50, that means we're an expansionary market. Well, right now, the United States is at 47.7. We got a, a reading last week. And, uh, you know, I, I also looked up uh, what other nations are being tracked by this PMI indicator. And very, very interestingly, whether uh, these 40 year nation or sorry, all 40 of these nations, um, they're either below 50 or just at 50 right now. So to see a recession is one thing, but a global recession all taking place at one time, this ISM indicator has, has is rarely ever wrong. And it is literally f flashing red every single place that we go. So again, I vote the market goes up forever and that may, that may work for the short term, but we also need to be uh, a little bit cautious here about where we find ourselves because this is a big deal. Uh, number three is the quantitative tightening cycle that we're in. So uh, we did quantitative easing, which made it easier to, you know, to get loans and to uh, just make that a lot more prevalent. Well, now they're still having to run off the balance sheet and they're doing so at about $90 billion monthly. So a little over a trillion dollars per year. Uh, this is a very big deal because the, the Treasury balance sheet has ballooned out of control uh, since 2008. Uh, also to note with 2008, uh, a tightening of quantitative uh, measures has never actually been done. And it was literally the opposite approach of what we had in 2008. So a lot of what got us out of uh, 2008 was that we just loosened uh, and we, re we, we reduced rates, we loosened up the lending and uh, you know the economy got booming again, specifically in the housing market. And that right now is a significant, significant challenge, which leads me to my fourth point, which is that the, uh, uh, the softening right now in the home building and so, you know, real estate's a lagging indicator. You know, it never leads, it lags. Why? Because permits take months or years to, to take place. But also we can understand that it's more costly today for a contractor to have employees, to have acquired the land, uh, to get supplies. We've got delays associated with this. But more importantly, the buyer is, is unable to purchase at the same price that it had uh, the ability to when interest rates are at 3%. You know, so 30 year rate right now is over six. Uh, and that's if you don't have PMI insurance, you know, so having 20 percent down, um, that's a really big deal because essentially doubling uh, uh, borrowing has doubled. And so I'd say it's a buyer's market right now for real estate. But but where are the buyers today, at least on a on a national scale down in Florida, where you're at, uh, there's still uh, some appetite because people are trying to get out of higher tax places. They're potentially trying to get out of uh, uh, weather cycles that they're not as fond of. But uh, uh, but we're seeing the home building softening right now in a very significant way. And then the fifth one is the, uh, the U.S. consumer. And so as we understand the, the United States economy, 70% of it is based upon the consumer's buying and spending power. Well, the consumer has had two full years now of significant inflation increases. And though we are seeing inflation coming down and the Federal Reserve has you know, given us that, that, that thumbs up that they're seeing the beginning of that occurring, um, you know, that just means that we're going to have lower inflation for longer. It doesn't mean, though, that the higher prices that we see today and we're paying at the grocery store are going to go away or revert back to where they were. So the U.S. consumer, my personal opinion, has not been prepared for the cycle that we find ourselves in today. The White House hasn't been preparing them. And in fact, they're saying, hey, there's no recession. They've been telling us there's a recession coming the whole time and it's never happened. We're stronger today than we ever have been. Well, that's pretty crazy talk as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but uh, the US consumer is, is being hurt significantly. You can see spending rates uh, going down. We can see saving rates going down. But more importantly, credit cards are going up. And let's just be honest here. No one uh, is putting, you know, uh, balances on a credit card because that was a good idea. I mean, 20% plus on interest rates uh, is crazy, but we're being forced to do it. But, you know, the average consumer is kind of running their, uh, their, their family budget, kind of like the, uh, the Congress has been running our national deficit. You know, so we find ourselves with a new deficit ceiling conversation coming up here. And again, I do not believe this has been modeled well for us. And I think that uh, my worst case scenario is kind of coming true uh, as uh, as I guess we're going to be seeing these numbers unfold here over the next few months. All right. So the reality is going to assert itself. There's nothing the Fed can do or the BLS or the federal government. They can put out rosy scenarios, rosy predictions. But. The economy certainly looks looks like it's headed for a tailspin, not to mention the inverted yield curve, which has an uncanny ability to predict these recessions.
That's right. And Carrie, just even to the point, um, when we see the pause from rising more interest rates because they think they got to the terminal rate, and then they see a pivot to reduce rates, very, very important for people to understand that the average downturn after a pause and pivot occur, the average downturn is 35.5% over the next 15 months. And so again, I'm not coming up with these. This is just factual as far as how other cycles have, have you know, performed in the past. And so to say this time it's different, well, I'd say that those are pretty different in, uh, words than, than we should be looking at right now uh, because th that's pretty dangerous. So, you know, it's a daily beauty contest out there. I mean, I, again, I vote things turn around, they work out, uh, but I'm just not seeing the supply side economics that it's going to take. We're just, we're, we're, we're curbing demand. We're not fixing supply. If we were lowering taxes, if we were, you know, drilling and doing more exploration here for oil at home, if we hadn't canceled the Keystone pipeline, if we uh, weren't seeing, you know, the, the jobs and wages and the challenges uh, that, that are just starting to come to light, and hopefully the statistics will start to reveal a little bit but more clearly, uh, you know, I, I'd say that, uh, uh, you know, that we're on our, our, our way to a better, a better time frame. But it just seems to me like things are just slipping further and further. And uh, this is going to get beyond the Fed's reach uh, here without too much time. All right. Well, we really appreciate you coming on, David. Uh, we want to contact you through the web, connect with you. How do you do that? Sure. Uh, people can go to, to our website, myspg.com. And uh, I've actually got uh, educational classes that are going to be going on here uh, in things like Social Security, taxes, principal retirement planning, investing in the 21st century, teaching people how to ride bulls and tame bears, which is, you know, how to take advantage of the opportunities when we're, they're here and avoid the, the pain and the challenges when they're not. And so we've got a, uh, a, a you know, methodology and way in which we do this, uh, a proprietary process that uh, that helps us to evaluate these timeframes and capitalize on times like now. So, you know, the market cycles are likely going to be very different over the next decade uh, than, than what they have been leading to this part of the decade. And so the question is, how are we prepared uh, to transition uh, into this new economy post-2020? So the 21st century is not for the faint of heart, especially for those nearing and entering retirement. Couldn't agree with you more, David. Thanks for coming on. If you've got a question for David or myself, the email is kl at kerrylutz.com. Please write your questions below on the YouTube channel and go over to the site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Make sure you sign up for your free newsletter. David, a pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. Hey, appreciate you, Kerry. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.